Hello everyone, today we talk about uh, Republican and Early Imperial Roman shield painting more than patterns because um, I believe that on Roman shield patterns it's been written a lot sometimes, especially in our uh, digital era we see on the internet circulating all these beautiful pictures with Roman uh, banners and symbols and this list of shield patterns, very colorful ones and there is a lot of debate relatively to this um, historically speaking because we don't actually have a direct evidence of of how the Roman shields were painted. We have actually a pretty good understanding that, that they were. This is actually the, the only firm point. But there is also for wargamistic interest in the idea of showing that basically that Roman legion had throughout most of its very long history because <coughs> United Roman legions as individual uh, organical structures were maintained um, essentially for centuries had their own peculiar um, shield pattern that couldn't vary and that every Roman legionnaire was supposedly have painted on this shield and this is really very debatable instead because we don't really know our evidence is pretty scanny. Um, today I would like to concentrate more than else on the on the function of shield painting and what the usage could could practically be. Um, not much just for um, recognizing um, the uh, belonging of a certain soldier from an organic point of view um, or even in terms of sides of, uh, um, in which, uh, uh, into which he was fighting but also and especially from a psychological point of view that I think it's very very important and uh, relatively overlooked, especially in, in modern perspectives when we are used to uniforms, to standardization. In ancient times it was a little bit different. The Romans came pretty close to our concept of um, <coughs> uniformation, at least uh, on the levels of, of certain standards of equipment. Relatively to the individual look, there wasn't really anything like a uniform proper, although some certain suggestions have been made at least in terms of, I don't know, a, a certain uh, grade um, wore a certain color while maybe the troop uh, used another one, but <coughs> more of, of that um, later. And we will actually discuss that too, because um, it actually goes a bit together too with the same um, with the same um, uh, concept. I, I was searching, ah, here I have what I wanted to discuss relative to that as well. So I will st I, I would start from actually the historical evidence that we have. First the documentary and then the um, archaeological one. Uh, documentary meant written sources, really, also the archaeological find can be considered as a historical documentation in practice. But aside from, the, aside from this, we are told on an occasion by Tacitus, or Tacitus, as you want to call him, I remember you mm, at the beginning of the video that I um, usually pronounce the Latin names in, in two ways that are respectively in, or in, uh, in order uh, of, uh, of time the, uh, pron uh, the, the restituta pronunciation and the ecclesiastical one. So it's not that I'm guessing about their the actual Latin pronunciation, just giving you the two options because uh, we don't really know how the Romans spoke. We I believe that it, it was closer to the restituta, obviously, but um, a lot of people are le legitimately still using the ecclesiastical pronunciation that can go as well. So in this case, Tacitus in uh, restituta and Tacitus in ecclesiastical um, pronunciation. So, okay, uh, Tacitus tells us on an occasion that um, um, certain Roman legionnaires fighting uh, in a civil war, so Romans against Romans, uh, at a certain point uh, mingled uh, unnoticed into the enemy army because uh, they uh, essentially picked up and discarded enemy uh, shields. 
Um, this is very important because I implicitly uh, it means that the shield was um, at least an important but perhaps even the only mean of um, identification for the fighter. Um, this is very important to bear in mind because the Romans definitely had a um, as I was saying before, a, a, a certain degree of standardization of their equipment that, however, could still vary substantially. I mean, not all the swords were the same, not even the uh, the heavy javelins were the same, not even the shields were the same, probably, because today we think that uh, even at the peak of the... Um, uh, during the early imperial times, actually, the, the uh, iconic rectangular uh, uh, Roman shield uh, was actually a um, uh, present in minor numbers even compared to the uh, oval shields. There are also tactical reasons for this that we have to to, to understand relatively to the differentiation of the various uh, Roman units within a same legion. Um, but what probably Tacitus here is really saying is that it's, it wasn't really about the shape of or the type of the shield, but rather, and obviously in this sense, um, the, uh, the emblems that were painted over the shield. And this is even more meaningful because these uh, legionnaires had picked up uh, um, discarded enemy shields. So they had basically taken the, the same the very same shield that the uh, enemy Roman um, army was uh, using. Um, the fact that this was a civil war, Romans versus Romans, um, uh, it's all the more meaningful. This probably would have not been so easy to do with different populations, but we still have to remember that um, the at this time the, the Roman auxiliaries in part were still equipped partly with their traditional uh, gear. Uh, the Romans definitely allowed the auxiliaries to wear any kind of Roman military equipment that existed in their, at their disposal, also because the auxiliaries were often more involved into actual mm, combat than the legionnaires themselves. Um, <coughs> so in this sense you might have found, I don't know, a Batavian auxiliary, let's say, that maybe had a very quite syncretic uh, gear in this sense with certain national, say, or traditional weapons and then certain Roman ones. It might have been as well possible that, I don't know, uh, a German, uh, uh, since we're talking about the Batavians in the at the Rhine frontier might have uh, captured a, a Roman shield as well as a Roman armor and that you could see um, these German warriors fighting into their forests actually um, wearing up a, a Roman armor uh, including the mm, segmented one, <laughs> the Gallic imperial helmet it's completely normal, these things happen all the time in any war uh, which is what probably the most um, powerful um, civilizations hybridator, uh, as well as the structure, at least potentially. Um, but uh, what I'm saying is that um, sometimes the the relative um, variety of uh, the uh, the the military equipment of a single soldier could mm, oblige substantially the guy to be r and all the others. To, to be recognized um, through the pattern that was painted on the shield. So this is a pretty evident function, right? And this is something like you, you're wearing a banner, a flag, and, and you're easily recognizable. Um, and this is a problem that really happened all the times in history, because even during the modern and contemporary uh, era when the first uniforms actually the first uniforms, it, it's really difficult to say when uniforms actually appeared in the modern sense. Usually we talk about the Swedish army during the uh, Thirty Years' War that had a, a certain degree of, um, of centralization and military organization that allowed the idea that every soldier had to, to wear um, a certain uniform that, however, was pretty much not non-standards. It was probably it was probably a matter of colors and else. Then with, with industrialization, 
this came to be easier. I mean, every soldier could be uh, at least wearing a uniform. Uh, the, the gear could be different, but the uniform was usually si quite similar, if not identical. But a lot of people tend to forget that after two months of campaign, of, mil of a military campaign, un your own uniform doesn't exist physically anymore because it, it simply gets destroyed. So in all times in history there has been the problem of actually needing to distinguish someone on the base of something that was usually flags, because flags can be relatively, you know, they can one flag can work for very large amounts of men. The same can go w ac accordingly to Roman shields in practice, because also the shield breaks, also the shields um, deteriorates over time. Um, <coughs> so we don't really, I, I personally think, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, that there is no evidence whatsoever in all Roman history um, of this problem of shield replacing because of um, consumption. I mean, we know that Romans had a pretty solid logistical system for which they could produce others, but when you are out in, in campaign, maybe even across the Roman borders, I think either you build your shields on your own, if they break, which was definitely done. I mean, we are still in a time in history where people had a, a quite a widespread technical um, know-how and how to build things with... I mean, also technology was relatively more simple, but actually building a shield um, was something uh, technologically complex. I mean, the, the Roman shield required definitely, as well as many others, uh, a um, a good ability in, in producing it. It's not anything cons conceptually difficult, it's essentially a multi-layer um, wooden, shi uh, wooden shield, but you, you have also the metal parts, you have the uh, umbo, you have... I mean, it, it's not something extremely easy to build. I'm just saying that maybe if it, your pretty good shield breaks down, you can still use uh, something else, including the enemy shields, by the way. So in, in desperate situations, it's pretty obvious that a Roman legionnaire could use even a, a, a non-Roman shield to defend, because conceptually they're essentially the same, and, and functionally they're essentially the same thing. Excuse me, I, I drink a little. So <coughs> the late Roman writer uh, Vegetius also tell us that um, uh, they, um, the, um, I'm quoting here, making a very, attempting a very rapid translation. So, in order for the soldiers in the, mm, let's say, mess, <laughs> in the chaos of battle, they didn't uh, go, um, basically stretch out uh, from their own uh, comrades, uh, they painted on the shields uh, different symbols for each cohort, this is interesting, called digmata, which is evidently a Greek uh, uh, term, which um, even t uh, still today um, uh, it's used to, to be called in, in, in this way. And instead, in the internal part of the shield, it was written the name of every soldier and the name of the court or sentry uh, to which um, he belonged. Um, as you um, understand from the title of, uh, of my video, and I said it before, we're discussing essentially only Republican and early Imperial Roman times. Majetius is from the 4th century, and in the 4th century we have actually a, um, a very a beautiful uh, source, that is the Notitia uh, di Dignitatum, or Notitia Dignitatum, which actually survives uh, through medieval manuscripts, telling the truth, um, which is basically um, a, a 5th century army list, which um, um, uh, depicts um, um, the, um, the, shield, the the various shield patterns, essentially, with the unit names. Uh, we're not going to discuss it today because um, uh, it's a very important source on its own, and uh, I would like to dedicate um, um, a video to it uh, only. So we're not discussing it, but. Um, 
conceptually, uh, I mean, it doesn't get far from, from what we were uh, um, saying uh, right now. But relatively to the Jetsus, um, the, um, uh, this quote, I think, uh, this is from the Jetsus 2 of 18, if you want if you, if you to know uh, where it is. I, I think it's very meaningful because it says especially one thing that the shields, um, and this is what I believe, generally speaking, it's still a speculation, uh, an hypothesis, but I think it does make sense that the, um, the shields were painted um, um, in, in this kind of uniform fashion on the cohort, hmm? uh, at a cohort level. This is very important because it doesn't say it, it was the whole legion having a, a unique shield pattern. It was actually single cohorts. Another very nice thing. Uh, I mean, it re <laughs> it reminds me when you know um, uh, you go to school as a, uh, uh, when you're a kid and you write the name or your name over the the books in case you you lose them so that you can track. Uh, people can track it back to you and it says that the shield was named indeed so um, this is very important because it actually tells you how individual was also the um, shield possession how much uh, legionnaires cared about their own shield and also had the name of the court or, or the century of belonging um, very meaningful um, <coughs> and relatively to shield patterns um, the um, um, the idea is um, that we have no direct evidence of um, actually uh, early imperial time patterns practice. Um, the um, and uh, more of that later. Uh, for now, relatively to the cohort uh, shield painting, uh, why I think it, it? Why do I think it's important? Well. Because the idea is that uh, the esprit de corps. Hmm? I mean, it's the idea that you don't paint a shield just because you belong to a legion. That was actually a pretty big thing. I mean, in, in times of Jetsus and with the Constantinian reforms, the legions were smaller. Hmm? Uh, but in this sense, it, it, it's all the more meaningful because it, it shows that even on such smaller scale, um, compared to early imperial times, the actual um, criterion which patterns were painted on the shields was the uh, belonging to a cohort. Um, <coughs> we don't really know at this point uh, what Vegetius is meaning for, for a cohort, at least. I, I'm sure he says somewhere, but I think there is no absolute certainty about uh, the numerical strength of these units. But at this time, the cohort does seem more uh, like a company unit, and every military man knows that the um, the company is the organic level with the um, greater sense of belonging into the army, because the company is basically the um, the, gr the largest um, tactically autonomous unit in in uh, military organics which means that it's basically the uh, the largest unit that it is commanded by a uh, an officer on the field the, uh, this officer knows practically um, companies are usually throughout history mm, something around 150 people. The reason for this is really related to uh, human cognitive capabilities because basically um, 150 is a uh, um, practically the maximum number of people an officer, uh, hence a human, however, can remember uh, in terms of individual uh, abilities. I mean, uh, the company officer knows practically on which men he can rely, what are their characteristics and all, because he's the guy who is uh, actively guiding them on the field. Um, obviously, there are also um, smaller repartitions, as we all know, um, but this unit is really what, tactically speaking, makes the... Uh, takes the lead in, in practice. So um, this develops very strong esprit de corps um, among the participants. 
Um, and it is not surprising that a Roman maniple, for instance, or maybe a, Rom a, a late Roman cohort, basically corresponded to this company level. Um, you know that even in early imperial times, actually the cohorts uh, were still split into maniples, namely. Also in the late Roman times there was probably this repartition. Um, and these ma maniples that made up uh, three of which made up one cohort, at least um, the, the standard-sized one, um, were in this sense probably still recalling their uh, ancient manipular esprit de corps that was pretty evident, especially in pre-Marian times, although that wasn't really a um, there was n not really a professional army before those times, um, if not towards the, the very end. Uh, and then eventually Marius formalized that, but the the idea is that uh, even in there the maniple was the uh, the most autonomous tactical unit, and not surprisingly it equated to uh, uh, 160, 120 men, so essentially the same size of a company. Uh, you know that the maniple strength actually varied over time; it wasn't the same throughout all the uh, republican times. Um, so, uh, it is pretty obvious in this sense, and it's been suggested actually by many scholars, that, that the greatest sense of belonging um, uh, of a Roman legionnaire was not really about the legion, it was more about the cohort, mm, or even smaller tactical uh, units. Um, um, so, this is very meaningful in terms of shield painting, because shield painting is something you do pretty autonomously. Um, it, it is not really something you can... Um, well, more of that later, when, when we talk about colors first. First things first, let's pass to archaeological evidence. Um, first of all, we have extensive shield patterns um, 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 depicted on, uh, on the Thracian's column. Um, it's been suggested that these um, uh, shield patterns were actually meant to celebrate uh, a particular mm, legion or, however, a particular Roman unit to um, to the campaign. Mm, so, with a very specific intent. Always consider that Trajan columns is as a propaganda um, source. It was meant to be watched by the uh, uh, citizens of Rome the reality of warfare. I mean, it's an extremely precious precious source, but uh, we shouldn't equate what we see on the Trajan columns as the factual reality of warfare. We should have been <laughs> among uh, um, uh, within a legion to actually understand that. Um, so, the there are also other monuments that display these patterns, actually quite um, um, extensive, but it's um, it's very uh, difficult to basically track back any, fo you know, through these patterns the belonging to, to a certain particular unit that we can, th of which we know historically speaking existing, like a legion or a particular um, cohort uh, or a auxil um, of the auxilias and, and or ally or stuff. Um, so um, the um, the the very few evidence that we actually have about a uh, painted Roman shield is the um, semi-cylindrical scrotum from Dura Europos. Dura Europos is I don't remember what it is. If it is Syria or already Iraq, I'm pretty not sure, but. It was a Roman fortress um, uh, on the far eastern Roman borders, with one with with uh, uh, with uh, the Parthians, and um, it, it's actually late. I think it's of the beginning of the third century, or something like that. Correct me if I. Um, and 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 in this sense, it it it, it belongs as a sh uh, shield type to. Um, to a group that seems to have vanished exactly into those years, in the sense that the rectangular shield is something you see practically mostly during the 
second, first and second century AD, and we neither know how much was widespread compared to the oval shield, telling the truth. So it's been suggested, since it's extremely well decorated, it's um, that it, it might have been a sort of relic of the past used for ceremonies, for parades, hmm? because it, it's First of all, it is, it's extremely richly decorated. It's, it's painted at top with an eagle flanked by w winged victories. Um, at the bottom, it has a lion flanked with stars. Um, so all symbolisms that you know in the ancient world actually were pretty widespread. Telling the truth, the, the Romans were mm, at this time very well uh, acquainted with um, Hellenistic culture um, uh, and all. Um, and it's um, and the um, the uh, um, just for saying, that, uh, go look at that the Dura Europa's shield and scutum. It's it's very famous on the internet. You can have very beautiful pictures of that. Um, so just to say what it, what uh, what I'm talking what I'm talking about. Um, and you immediately understand that it immediately gives the idea that uh, it is a ceremony, a, sh a parade shield. Mm -hmm. um, and in this sense, the even the colors in, as a decoration are pretty are relative. Uh, it's, sure, it's surely an extremely important archaeological uh, find, but um, it doesn't really tell us extremely much about the um, combat shield and that the Roman legion used and how uh, it was decorated in practice. At least it doesn't tell ex um, um, to, to other uh, also about other characteristics, probably also in its uh, size and forms and all. But it can, it can, however, give the idea of what a Roman painted shield was like in terms of degree of of also of um, elaboration of um, decorative motives and all. The uh, we have, however, sir, uh, another evidence. Um, we have actually very few surviving Roman shields. The other one, only I think, it's the Roman scutum of uh, Al Fayum uh, in Egypt. Um, uh, as you notice, this organic material. Um, um, to, um, items um, kind of better survived in a semi-arid, dry um, environment like could be uh, at Dura Europa's at the uh, beginning of the Arabian Desert and the uh, and Egypt. Um, however, the um, we have also certain mosaics actually showing a. Um, two gladi uh, gladiators, essentially. Um, this is dated from the 1st or 2nd century AD. Um, I don't remember is if, if these are the ones of Piazza Armerina in, in Sicily. Uh, it should be. Um, and they have uh, essentially certain sculptum, it's a pl plural of sculptum, uh, painted bright red and yellow. Mm -hmm. Uh, with very um, very elaborated um, motives painted on them, um, and the um, um, it it, it um, um, there are also other gladiators fighting with other shields, um, and they have so maybe uh, they show a, a black scorpion with claws at the top and tail at the bottom, um, so. The uh, relatively to the colors, you can simply go check them out. And this is just for saying that um, we have evidence of such units. By the way, there is also this idea that, for instance, the the, the Praetorians um, usually wore um, um, in their emblems and shields motives the the scorpion because the the Praetorian um, um, god, as um, you know, the, the the nine cohorts that were stationed in Rome, the Praetorians actually were something very ancient in Republic and even in previous times, um, um, because they were simply the guards of the ma Roman magistrates. Uh, then eventually, the Praetorian guard proper is this nine cohorts that were created um, officially in Rome. We don't we usually think by Tiberius. 
uh, who allegedly gave them uh, the scorpion as a symbol because uh, he was born under the zodiac sign of the scorpion. So um, the Romans were also quite superstitious. They believed and were pretty keen on astrology and all these things. So you find also certain uh, you know, astrology is full of um, mythological animals from from the Greek um, uh, polytheism and all that eventually the Romans uh, um, adopted uh, um, and all. Um, so nothing's really strange about this. Um, but even there, w we don't really know whether this is true you know as moderns we usually associate that because i think there is a source that claims that openly but we don't have an extreme um, certainty about that as a matter of fact we have a very few certainties at all uh, regarding anything that concerns these um let's say uniform roman uniforms if we can call uh, them in in such a fashion so uh, the um, we know we have evidence, for instance, of um, um, the, the certain decorations were also cut from thin metal sheets and attached eventually to the painted surface of the shield. We know th that this is what the Greek hoplites did as well, um, um, and um, uh, the. Um, uh, although it would hinder weapon points from being glanced off. Uh, however, the um, the only evidence we have of this uh, is um, from the uh, shield found at Doncaster, um, which uh, I don't know if, if whether it was actually even a, a legionnaire shield proper. Um, and uh, the... Um, um, um so w we remain with this idea that th there could be an oblique work over the the painted shield but probably and and more likely uh, the the greater part of shield decorations was actually simply painted mm. so a shield is also something that you use and can break quite easily so I it's very important to to make differentiation between parade shields and actual combat shields uh, because we know that even in in armor and um, there is this problem sometimes we find extremely elaborated armor that also weighs pretty a lot and people say like this this had to be used in parades rather than in battle um, uh, this is true although it, it's also pretty difficult sometimes to, to understand what uh, were, you know were the uh, d we're drawing the line, and where we can't draw really a line, because take the the, the cavalry masks that have been found. Many people say, well, these were um, usually for parades because they also hampered view um, and all. But who knows? Really, mm, there are in history many other examples of, ca of cavalry masks. They're still uh, um, a face facial protection, so it's not really a uh, um, it's really something that you could have still found um, in into actual combat. So, but these are topics that now do not really um, concern us more than much. Um, what I, I wanted really to talk about instead um, is the concept of standardization. So, what was the actual need for the uh, Roman army? to um to have worn a certain specific color or not um this is actually a very very vast um um topic um today we're talking about shields so we i'm going to stick to to that really but um theoretically this um these colors could be conceived, uh, I mean the shield patterns could be considered as well together with uh, with other, um, with a color of other um, uh, gear including especially the tunics, um, including the uh, the banners, you know, uh, there is this idea, I mean if you look at a time in history when we start having more, actually uh, um, much more extensive 
a, a material knowledge of what existed or not, that is the Middle Ages. We know that in the feudal age, most of armor, even um, uh, shields, and uh, were actually and and surcoats were all usually painted in 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 a certain fashion. Um, the surcoat and as well as the heraldic symbol um, on on the shield uh, were uh, a pretty important mean of identification. The feudal age, though, is a bit different from the Roman one because the feudal lord uh, had many reasons more to be recognized on the battlefield from a Roman legionnaire. Uh, because he could be um, captured, ransomed. There was also a, a very strong um, sense of oneself into the feudal nobility for which uh, they had to prove that they were not cowards and therefore they had to clearly mm, look as uh, the person that they, mm, the, the people that they were, as individual nobles. The Roman legionnaire uh, was instead someone who usually went into uh, a meat grinder as an individual soldier about which nobody cared extremely much. I mean, it was definitely more important the survival of the single legion than the individual legionnaire. Um, so this probably, um, at least in combat, made a pretty good uh, difference. Um, I personally don't think, at least there is no evidence whatsoever, uh, that, uh, for instance, the Roman armor was painted. Uh, usually Roman armor could differ in colors uh, relatively to uh, the material it was made of, either bronze or iron. Um, I'm sure there might have been some form of painting for more elaborated choruses and all, but I don't think that the, the, the segmented uh, armor or the coat of mails were, were painted. I could be mistaken, I actually haven't checked at this out, but I'm pretty sure I've never read anything like that in any Roman um, uh, history book. Um, the, the importance of the shield instead, of a, of a uniformed painted shield, um, as I was telling before, seems to have come usually um, mostly from a, of an esprit de corps reason. Um, uh, also related to the idea of definitely who was who, determining who was who on the battlefield, we know that Roman legions were able to perform very complex maneuvers. Um, so mm, there might have been also into the battle actual problems in distinguish which unit was was in a certain point of the clash uh, f for the same commanders to to order. Um, to issue orders and all, but definitely the idea that uh, this corp has to to, to stay together uh, in practice. Uh, also, as Bajetsu states, I mean he explicitly writes that this was also a point of reference for the same Roman legionnaire that during the combat could find himself uh, outside of the formation and he could easily recognize yeah, his unit. Uh, for coming back to it through the shield colors. Um, and uh, uniforming in this sense a um, um, all the shields of a cohort with a certain pattern uh, it was not really something difficult uh, in my opinion. The problem is that it, it wasn't really a concept, a full concept of standardization. First of all, um, probably uh, every shield was according to me, probably decorated in, in relatively different fashion. I mean, maybe uh, you see here in background pictures all these um, yellow shields with um, actually displaying all the same colors uh, and all. Um, this could be feasible as well, but um, it's also plausible that every shield kind of came out in a different form. Um, industrialization did, did not exist at the time, so if, if anything, in the fashion the shield is made, it can also change uh, motives. Um, before we were talking about that rectangular shields were um, uh, throughout their 
their whole existence were uh, sided by oval shields. Um, so this also changes actually the the, uh, the surface of uh, on which you are painting. So the the um, and the motives can be uh, different also in this sense. Um, so probably uh, the idea of having like in in, in this picture all yellow uh, shields was probably it kind of made more sense than just saying you know let's make these shield motives all alike because it is something really visual that helps the the guy in in the chaos of melee to recognize uh, the actual unit at a first glance surely uh, it didn't take to actually look at the the all all the details of the of the patterns to 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 distinguish the unit uh, you have all white uh, um, say yellow shields like these okay fine i know that that's my unit and it kind of makes sense uh, in my opinion um kind of makes sense also because if all cohorts had been made of the same color there might have been doubts of who was who in there um because um uh, the guys at this point had didn't have been <laughs> let's say uh, binoculars, uh, so even the the Roman sh um, uh, the xidla, the, the the flags and banners were, as far as we know, not very huge, uh, like in later times in history sometimes. So probably um, this uh, compact compact mass of hundreds or thousands of, of legionnaires marching with all a um, uh, with, with shields uh, all of, of one color was probably like having a, a very large flag that you can you could recognize at a distance and even during battle you can understand you know which cohort is is where in in this sense so having different colors for each cohort that's the reason why I like the hypothesis of the um, uniform um, uh, color for for every uh, cohort uh, or maybe maniple uh, as well, because um, we're saying saying it before. Also, the cohort wasn't, um, you know, it was probably split into into action, into smaller, into smaller parts. Um, the um, on a larger level, um, uh, let's say uh, at a legionary level, so. Um, uh, you know the idea of painting one um the uh, let's say uh, one legion's shields all with one color um also has another problem in it which uh, is really the idea that the the roman administration has basically to provide part of the color to these units now the roman army was uh, a terrible um resources eating machine uh, the greatest expenses of the Roman army were the ones of of, uh, of the Roman state were w the ones of the army. The, ar the Roman army was uh, the most func probably most functional um, uh, statal um, uh, institution that the Romans had created. Um, uh, a, a legion of five thousand men. Um, is an extremely high uh, has an extremely high logistical cost for uh, ancient um, uh, economies potential um, and um, uh, keeping it also in terms of uh, of, of, of armament is uh, even more expensive obviously um, so this is um the 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 criticism that has been done relatively even for the Roman tunics actually um, made of all one color is that this color um, had to be in the sense paid by the state in some measure and it's quite unlikely for the few sources that we have from the few sources that we have that actually the Roman administration actually thought about coloring the um, the uh, the legionnaires uh, gear. Um, we know that there were certain commissions that depended on the uh, actually uh, legion, uh, the singular legion administration. That were things like I don't know. We need twenty clothes of um, wool and maybe uh, ten in white and ten in red. 
so um, also from so it wasn't really a ma there wasn't probably a massive uh, state uh, management relatively to these things it was probably also the legionnaires actively uh, building or providing their own equipment on a local base we know that there were uh, Roman uh, armories definitely scattered all, o all over the empire um, but especially in early imperial times this seemed to have existed in coincidence with the same legionary uh, camps and quarters and only in the later um, Roman uh, times uh, you know the, the so-called fabricae uh, or fabricae armorum were actually uh, fully controlled by the state uh, centrally and in, the, in, um, in the heart of the empire and therefore providing uh, the equipment for uh, all the legionnaires and probably at, at that time there were still legionnaires actually providing their own equipment by themselves so it kind of makes sense that um, 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 coloring all these mm, all these troops all with one color for the for the Roman administration would have been a huge cost and that actually a huge extra cost at least and that uh, actually the um, the singular regions provided to such uh, details let's say uh, this happened b also because the legion was a sort of uh, world on its own you know that Roman legions basically from the time of Augustus were settled uh, into uh, certain uh, localities um, that um, substantially um, um, so the rise from the Roman castra of, of Roman cities um, so the legionnaires uh, the legions were attached to that and they um, um, they um, they treated they considered the, their castra a bit like their homes we know that even uh, families sometimes lived into the Roman um, camps and and actually most of the times uh, the, the the life the, of the Roman legionnaire was pretty uh, peaceful. If you look at um, all the wars that have been fought in Roman times, actually it could there could be uh, even centuries for uh, during which a, a, a legion stationed in a certain place actually didn't see any uh, any war. They might have fought against I don't know brigands or or in against minor incursions but generally speaking the, the, the Roman um, legionnaire's life uh, in early imperial times was relatively uh, peaceful and mortality also pretty low um, so the idea is that the uh, these legionnaires were however key, uh, a very efficient armed force even in, in times of peace because they were intensely trained um, and however they still had plenty of free time and in this free time it's perfectly possible that the guys could mm, build their own um, equipment they could buy them they could commission it to someone to a local and, and we we know that because certain a uh, roman equipment has a particular um maybe regional um uh decoration style so that we know that probably th this depended on the local um, of a mix of, of the legionnaire um, smiths and of the uh, even local um, uh, craftsmen so um, we we actually get this picture and at this point it, 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 it kind, kind of makes a lot of sense to um, to think that actually the colors were based uh, were, were mm, were decided by the local legionary administration and that they didn't fit in a um, larger scale of Roman armies um, ideal for which they had all to be equipped in a certain sense um, because that was mainly a tactical uh, uh, use I mean the the concept of uniform did not exist because um, um, it was enough to see a um, a guy wearing the so-called kingulum militaris that is basically the belt with with a sword to say oh that's a military man it was uh, the, the roman legionnaire in this sense was pretty uh, also socially pretty proud of, of boasting that 
And in the ancient world, ancient world this uh, uniform idea w wasn't there because in tribal war in the tribal world, usually every freeman uh, brought uh, war arms. Uh, in the more civilized, sedentary world, like in the Roman um, <laughs> world. Um, um, a soldier in this sense was was evidently the guy who who wore uh who carried arms because usually uh the romans uh as a strong central state they they can tended to disarm the populations so it, it was pretty evident so that was pretty enough and uh, the the our modern concept of uniform uh actually derives from industrial standardization and from the idea that the uniform is uh is something that um you know it, it's it's uh it's a dress essentially um that that is produced in mass scale all uh all equal uh in uh at the time and even for most of the modern contemporary era the uniform is really having uh, a unique color mm. um even the actual pieces of cloth can really differ in a still half industrialized uh world because um a lot of them were practically manufactured uh, so this happened also in very recent times um in in history uh and that's my main criticism towards uh the idea of the let's say the pushed idea of standardizations um the um the um i don't remember what i wanted to say ah yes about the psychological effect of a um a uniform color for a certain tactical unit this is actually very important because um and, and it lays its uh roots in in the same Mm, political ideal of the Roman Empire. I mean, the Roman Empire um, was definitely an exception in um, in most of European history. I mean, sometimes we reason as if it, it was normal that an empire existed. Sometimes uh, an empire like that existed. That sometimes we exchange it for a 19th century national state. Uh, uh, so we we attach to it. Uh, uh the same idea of of standard of uniform standardization in in very modern terms the roman empire wasn't really anything like that but still for those time standards for the majority of people that that lived at the time that were essentially tribes uh, the the organization of an em of an empire like the roman one was something incredible i mean it was um the ancient world was all w the ancient world's mentality was all one with um sort of religious ideals and even having an empire that stretched from Scotland to the uh, Persian Gulf um, equated to ruling the world practically the, the Romans um, first of all they had a very um, different geographical um, uh, knowledge than, than ours uh, maybe they, they knew that China existed but they ignored Russia for instance just for telling you how spaces were conceived in a different way um, but the um, the real point is that such a state of organization centralized organization was unknown to peoples like that eventually came to be part of the Roman Empire like like the Celts for instance that even served so massively in the Roman army especially the Gauls um uh during imperial times so um the psychological effect of a Roman legion so as a compact body of fully uh of armored and and equipped uh uh trained um soldiers was something astonishingly frightening for another population like uh it is true that the, the tribal uh, mindset basically um didn't consider itself at, 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 at all scared by the romans on the contrary populations like the germans or, or other peoples always actually felt themselves as superior to the romans they never they 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 but they, however they understood what the romans were they understood that they were something 
terribly efficient. They were something that they couldn't reach to. Their superiority was felt in the um, individual tribesmen ideal of the of courage uh, that in this sense went beyond just wearing uh, an armor like the Romans or marching straight in formation. It was uh, really about the individual strength. But even these peoples understood the very hard way that uh, <laughs> that the Romans really, had, you know, being a trained um, professional force like the Roman one was a um, was the result of their own of, of many bloody defeats uh, inflicted to these uh, tribal populations. So, uh, and this is um, this is valid also for Hellenistic kingdoms that didn't reach uh, a scale of standardization like the, the one of the Roman army, as far as we know, at least probably the Macedonians, or did in some fashion with their phalanxes and all. But uh, the Roman army had on, on its shoulders, in this sense, the 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 glory of being um, of having defeated even the the, the Macedonian uh, the military, and, and to have conquered the whole world, just like Alexander. But Alexander lasted a few; <laughs> the Roman Empire lasted much longer. So. Uh, if you are a tribesman who is used just to build weapons on, on your own, just to steal from the enemy, but in a very primitive and materially poor um, environment, um, with clanic warfare, with uh, a very few collective discipline, um, great uh, logistical difficulties, even just looking the Roman army at work was something frightening. We know that from from um, from the the Bello Gallico when Caesar writes that the the Gauls uh, from be behind the, the walls of their oppidum I don't remember which city which oppidum it was they they laughed at the Romans because they were shorter because they di they they didn't have uh, long blonde hair like the Celts and Caesar is stressing here a bit of stereotypes uh, because he wanted to emphasize uh, that instead eventually the Romans by building a lot of siege machinery in a very short time basically silenced the Celts that were laughing at them from, from, the, from the ramparts. Um, th there was a lot of stereotypization really because actually the Roman, the average Roman soldier was Celto Italic legionnaire of Caesar wasn't extremely different from a Gallic fighter in, in, in ethnical terms. But uh, it was really the difference that stood in the Roman army organization that even if we went beyond to, to touch other uh, identitary issues. Um, and you have to think in tactical terms of having in front of you uh, a unit that works silently, orderly. Um, if you add to this um, a unique color, you're also saying, look that we are even able to, to, to cure these details. It, it isn't much about the, the actual effect that can have a pain and shield in terms of recognizing uh, the units and all. It's really, look at these guys. They they have their shields all painted in, in a certain fashion. I mean, visually speaking, it scares you. Because you see this mass uh, to, to which the color gives uh, further uh, uniformity that, that goes straight at you. And, and you are really, uh, I can't say the term, but <laughs> you're not going to be very uh, excited about that happening, um, in, in a positive sense at least. Um, so the the real point here is that the color also made uh, a, a psychological impact on the enemy uh, by showing a solid compact uh, front that doesn't differ even in the uh, pigmentation of, of, the of, of the shields. And this is essentially my idea. Then in later times, there are also different uh, developments in the Roman army, but let's say that these are core concepts that really remain in many times in, in history. 
Um, one can debate about it, because we know, as a matter of fact, that not all shields in the Roman army were alike. But at the same time, it's pretty reasonable to, to think, that, in my opinion at least, that a certain degree of color uniformity was issued exactly for the, re in the, the reasons that we have explained. And this, not too surprisingly, comes back on the fields of Europe, not when uh, industrialization kicked in, but when the centralized state came in during the modern age. I mean, the, the, the Middle Ages in this sense had been based on um, clientels, on private, uh, essentially, political institutions. When the state uh, comes back to be a central uh, authority with as uh, a degree of influence on the uh, recruitment of the equipment and all, the uniform color comes back in existence. And even during the Middle Ages, by the way, we have evidence of, you know, certain uniformity in, in shield patterns and all. You know, if you take the, um, for instance, the Italian city-states of the low Middle Ages, th those were pretty um, centralized governments in, in a certain fashion for medieval standards. And we have extensive evidence of certain soldiers in in terms of hundreds, at least, that were equipped maybe all with the um, uh, Fleur de Lis the, of Florence, uh, with mm, white and red of, uh, of, uh, of Milan and all. So this isn't really anything strange. This is something that could happen theoretically all the times in history. Arguably, every, um, every army in history had a degree of uh, standardization, a certain degree. A standardization meant really in the mild form that we explained, not in the modern uh, inflexible one. Um, so, uh, in this sense, uniformity can also prove, um, can also tell much about the the same nature of nature of of the army in itself. Mm -hmm. From a color, you can understand what kind of enemy you have in front of you. And really, believe me, having a, a, a body mass um, of soldiers all wearing the same color is frightening. And this is the same concept uh, for which it was revived, aside from all the other useful reason, tactical reasons uh, in the modern age. Mm. Because it scares you. You know, you, if you look at 18th century warfare, you see all these guys with... Um, uh, with uh, you know hat gears and um, and um, and wigs even, wh which is ridiculous. With <laughs> sometimes people think that I don't know the the face powder and, and other stuff on on 18th century battlefields were kind of a very uh, feminine looking thing, but it, it is actually scary because it tells you that those guys. Um, are all ordered in that fashion, and that they cure even that minimal detail, and they stand inflexible as a line advancing at you and standing um, uh, in front of you, d even if you shoot at them. I mean, it is s in terms of the psychology of warfare, extremely p an extremely powerful um, thing, um, and everybody is uh, is scared by order and discipline on the battlefield, probably even more than you know shouting like a a drunken uh, monk, <laughs> you know, at the enemy, hoping to to scare it in in a very uh, animal way. Silence is all the more frightening because it shows that those guys have the guts not to 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 give in to uh, to uh, anxiety to uh, to uh, to 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 agitate to irritability and they can kick you <laughs> pretty hard out of that battlefield just with uh, with their moral forces mm -hmm. so I think this was a nice video I don't know what you think about it but I hope I've said anything meaningful. If you like this video, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel to receive further contents. And for now, I thank you um, uh, heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!